I love John Carpenter's original Halloween and consider it a horror masterpiece. That being said, I prefer Halloween 2. It's the greatest slasher film ever made, in my opinion. Of course, the fact that it's more of a pure slasher film than the original, which is more of a thriller suspense film in my opinion, is one of the reasons it'll never be held in the same esteem. You've heard or read it all before. Halloween 2 was just a greedy cash-in, like most sequels. It's tackier than the first film. More gore, more nudity, larger body count, etc. It was just John Carpenter and the other producers taking a cue from the Friday the 13th franchise and catering to that loathsome audience. Well, that loathsome audience are hardcore horror film fans. Brian De Palma also had a lot of sex and violence in his films and was likewise disregarded by many critics at the time. You either have a taste for those kind of films or you don't. So if you're only a casual horror film fan and don't really care for slashers, then yeah, stick with the original Halloween. It's classier, less blood, less kills. Overall, it's more restrained. But I'm a guy who'd rather watch The Palma's Body Double than a film like The Sixth Sense. So restraint isn't for me. Bring on the spectacle. Comparisons between the original and its follow-up notwithstanding, Halloween 2 will always be the greatest Halloween sequel. This is for several reasons. Firstly, it was made in 1981 when movies weren't all made by committee and still retained much of the edge and grit of 1970s cinema. Secondly, because it was just a few years after the first film, it didn't treat the original like it was some sacred, canonized classic. It was more like, hey, I guess we should cash in on this slasher craze we started with Halloween and make another one. No long discussions about the film's mythology, no reimagining, just good old fashioned, let's make another one. They simply continued the story and wrapped things up. Hence, it's not a remake sequel. It dares to take place primarily in a hospital, even if it sacrifices some of the seasonal aesthetic of the first film, because it makes sense to the story. It's treated as a climactic finale, and as such, kicks everything up a notch. Gore, deaths, thrills, etc. And the people driving the creative process were none other than the writers and producers of the first film, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. Carpenter ended up directing the death scenes after Rick Rosenthal's cut failed to elicit necessary scares. Carpenter's reshoots also enhanced the gore factor. So we have a film produced and written by Carpenter and Hill a film partially directed by Carpenter, a score by Carpenter, and his frequent collaborator, Alan Howarth. Cinematography by Dean Cundy, who shot the original and most of Carpenter's classic films. The leads from the original, Jamie Lee Curtis and Donald Pleasance, both returning. In short, the creative team from the first film, while they were still sharp and hungry, came back to finish what they started. It's a combination that will never be replicated again. For this reason alone, Halloween 2 has a magic that none of the other sequels will ever have, save for Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, which is its own weird and beautiful thing. Think of it as an awesome band recording a follow-up to their breakthrough album, and not too long after they recorded it either. The best albums don't result from overthinking. They result from a band still being in the zone and just knocking shit out. That's Halloween 2. Knocking shit out. It literally picks up from the first film and hits the ground running. Normally horror sequels allow a buffer of time to pass between installments. This way the sequel can reset and allows for the events to unfold in a similar fashion as they did in the first film. Originally, Carpenter and Hill considered doing this with Halloween 2. The plan was for the sequel to take place a few years after the first film and have Laurie Strode living in a high-rise apartment building. But during script meetings, some sort of crazy inspiration took hold of Carpenter and Hill, and they decided to make the film take place on the same exact night as the original. This gives the film an immediate urgency. When Dr. Loomis tells a Haddonfield resident, you don't know what death is, and the pumped up synth heavier theme kicks in, it's one of the most thrilling moments ever in a movie. It lets you know this is going to be one hell of a night, a Halloween party for the ages. The synth score, which builds on the themes from the original, is one of the various reasons this film feels like a giallo, an Italian horror thriller genre to the uninitiated. In many ways, the giallo influence is more explicit in Halloween 2 than in any of Carpenter's other films. After making the original, and also one of my favorite films, The Fog, 
Carpenter was ascending to the peak of his craft. When they produced Halloween 2, Carpenter and his team were between Escape from New York and The Thing. They were in the zone. They knew just how to incorporate the elements from their favorite movies. Dario Argento's Deep Red is one of the strongest influences on the film. Halloween 2 even borrows the woman's face in scalding water death from that film. This is another thing that gets me. It's like if a film is Italian and filled with sex and gore, it's somehow considered more sophisticated than an American film with a lot of sex and gore. Those Giallo films are just the sleazy B-movies of their country. Yes, the films are imbued with enough style and artistry that they seem more sophisticated than, say, a Friday the 13th film. And maybe they are, but then so is Halloween 2, because it's cut from the same bloody cloth of a Giallo. The first Halloween is about a guy in a mask killing babysitters. It's a great film, but not as groundbreaking as some people claim. In many ways, it's just a streamlined Black Christmas with more memorable music and perhaps stronger characters. Halloween 2, on the other hand, is a full-fledged American giallo. It's lush visuals, artful gore, Freudian themes, and bombastic soundtrack are all the elements you'd find in the best giallo. Dean Cundy especially outdoes himself in the movie. There are so many iconic shots in the film. Lori backed up against the elevator in her hospital gown. Michael Myers' eyes bleeding over the mask. These images are forever burned to my brain. Visually, my favorite scene is when Lori runs down into the hospital's basement. It's all bathed in a nightmarish red light. That's total Argento and Bava shit. And I love it. Even the marketing is iconic. You can't go to a horror film convention these days without seeing that skull in the pumpkin. Everything from the writing, to the score, to the cinematography, to the acting, and to the marketing elevates this film above most early 1980s slasher films. If this is a sleazy cash-in, then it's a grade A sleazy cash-in. Just like the best Giallo films, Halloween 2 engages the viewer through a dreamlike collision of image and sound. Even the soft lens flashback intercut with drips of blood is total Giallo stuff. And not having the killer's identity be a mystery for most Giallo films, Carpenter and Hill instead give us a surprise twist. In my opinion, making Laurie Strode Michael Myers' sister was a great move, and it was a good explanation for why Michael is subconsciously drawn to Laurie. Not dissimilar to Luke Skywalker learning Darth Vader as his father, Michael and Laurie being siblings opens up the story. Some people argue it's less scary if they're siblings. They think randomness is scarier. In the first film, Michael is just a crazy guy killing random babysitters, right? No, not right. Michael Myers was not just a crazy guy killing random babysitters. In the first film, Michael Myers is portrayed as evil incarnate who murdered his own sister and was now returning to his hometown to kill a bunch of teenage girls who reminded him of his sister. That's not so random. That's pretty damn targeted, if you ask me. The narrative of the first film is one big buildup to Myers confronting Lori. He specifically stalks her throughout the film. He kills all her friends and slowly encroaches on Lori, leading to the thrilling climax. When Carpenter and Hill came up with the sibling angle, it must have been an Eureka moment in which suddenly everything fell into place. Like the best twist, we accept it because it makes sense and works with what we've seen. And let's discuss the male gaze in terms of Pamela Shoup's character, Nurse Karen. It actually services the plot because it's Karen that's actually targeted by Michael and it's the reason he goes to the hospital. This is similar to how Michael targeted Lori and her friends in the first film. In the Carpenter Hill films, there is a sexual component to Michael's killings, and they're not random at all. In fact, it's clear Michael's psychosis is triggered by the incestuous and shameful feelings he had towards his sister Judith, and he targets women who trigger the same feeling, and it causes him to keep acting out his bloodlust and rage again and again and again. Carpenter had obviously taken a cue from Psycho and Norman Bates, who was likewise triggered by sexual attraction, and there's likewise an incestuous subtext, in Norman's case, pertaining to his mother. Most people misinterpret Michael's motivation in Halloween 2 and think of it as him tracking down his sister, Lori, at the hospital. They do this because that's what Dr. Loomis believes and states. And besides being a good device to get Loomis to go to the hospital at the end, it makes sense for his character to think this. 
However, it's clear from several earlier scenes that it was Michael's stalking of Nurse Karen that brought him to the hospital, a plot point that actually emerged in the Carpenter-directed reshoots. In an earlier draft of the script, it was Michael stalking reporter Deborah Lane that brought him to the hospital. But when that subplot was scrapped, Carpenter and Hill revised it to be Nurse Karen that draws Michael to the hospital in one of the most iconic moments in the film, in a scene that's visually pure Carpenter and Cundy. Originally, I thought, like many people I would assume, it was the boombox, the news report on the boombox that tipped off Michael that Laurie was at the hospital. And that's why he was heading off in that direction. But if that's the case, why was Karen even introduced at that moment with her friend Darcy talking about the lame Halloween party they were at and how she had to get to work? Why was that even introduced? It was introduced because that's who Michael was stalking and he was listening in on their conversation and that's why he's going. And what do you know, in the next scene, you see him there standing in the parking lot waiting for Karen to show up and there she is, she shows up and that's when he sneaks into the hospital. Now, does Michael strike you as the guy that goes places because of news reports he hears or does he strike you as the type of guy that likes to stalk pretty young women that remind him of his sister and then follows them and then kills them. I would say his pathology is pretty well established by this point in the franchise. He was clearly stalking Karen, overheard she was working at the hospital, followed her there, and then his mission was to track her down and kill her. Because that's what Michael Myers does. That's his M.O. Dr. Loomis is simply reading too much into it on a subconscious level, Michael and Lori might have a sense they're siblings, but neither is consciously aware. The dark irony is this is forever kept secret, as Dr. Loomis and Michael both meet their end in the hospital, and Lori is never told the truth. And judging from the narrative of this film alone, there's no reason she would ever find out. Because of the substandard sequels and resurrection of both Michael and Dr. Loomis, the Michael slash Laurie family connection was recontextualized as a broader narrative device. And in doing so, the concept was cheapened and all the irony and subtlety was removed from it. Carpenter and Hill were top-notch screenwriters and their writing strengths are very much on display in Halloween 2. It's unfortunate Carpenter himself has been a vocal critic of this film, his last writing collaboration with Deborah Hill. But artists aren't always the best judge of their own work because it's impossible for them to be objective. Carpenter didn't want to do a sequel and felt he was only doing it for the money and career leverage. On top of that, he begrudgingly had to go in there and save the film after being displeased with director Rick Rosenthal's rough cut. As stated before, Carpenter had to write and direct several new scenes and be more hands-on in the editing than he had originally planned. For these reasons alone, I think Carpenter's opinion of the film was forever soured. For the record, Jamie Lee Curtis has said she likes Halloween 2 and thinks it's a good film. Numerous fans agree with her, and I was not alone with being annoyed by the decision to recon the series to ignore Halloween 2 and reimagine Michael Myers as a random killing spree murderer with no discernible motivation. Although this might work better with the current times, it's ultimately not as twisted and provocative as the Michael in the Carpenter Hill films. Of course, we live in the age of mass shooters and the idea of a serial killer who were often acting out some dark sexual impulses seems like less of a threat today. But in the late 70s and early 80s, the headlines were dominated by serial killers whose psychosis was often intertwined with sexual deviancy of some kind. It might appear like tasteless exploitation to have a slasher killer stalk a woman undressing in a film these days. But this was a reflection of the current fears of the day. This is one of the reasons why art should be viewed in the context of the time in which it was created. Halloween 2 is a horror film from 1981 and of 1981. And to understand it is to also understand our culture at the time. Also, it's worth noting the influence this film appeared to have on James Cameron's original Terminator. From a similar scare at the end and the overall presentation of the shape as a relentless, unstoppable force is very proto-Terminator. This isn't the 1970s style boogeyman of the first film. This is a full out 1980s type of antagonist that's a more visceral and even greater physical threat. In addition to inspiring the Terminator, note how Jason is portrayed in the Friday the 13th film released prior to Halloween 2 versus 
The drastically different way Jason is portrayed in the Friday the 13th film released afterwards. It's clear from the timeline that the more pumped up and iconic Jason is modeled after the Michael Myers of Halloween 2 rather than his original incarnation. Whether you think it was a good thing or a bad thing, Halloween 2 was a far more influential film than it's given credit for. Like the first film, it redefined the horror genre and inspired much imitation. I also find Halloween 2 scarier than the original. The isolated hospital in the dead of night is a great setting for a horror film. In one of my favorite scenes, the camera stays on the hospital's video monitor and we see Michael walk into one of the rooms. Seconds later, one of the nurses walks off screen and then appears on the video monitor and we realize, oh my god, she's just inches away from Michael Myers. Fun stuff and evidence of a true Hitchcockian craftsmanship. This film plays with space and time to manipulate us, makes us squirm in our seats. Also, the fact that Halloween 2 hits the ground running and Michael grows more bloodthirsty as the night goes along creates great tension and a feeling of increasing dread. Finally, what I love most about the film is that it has a definitive ending. Dr. Loomis and Michael go up in a blaze of glory. Dr. Frankenstein in monster style. And we can pretend all the other sequels don't exist. Well, except for Season of the Witch, because that film is also awesome and would have been the beginning of a John Carpenter and Deborah Hill produced anthology series if people were hipper and didn't just want a bunch of remake sequels. But that's a whole other story and one I'll discuss next Halloween. Like roses and clover Then tell him that his lonesome nights are